trust me, I get it. You're feeling the pressure to keep your faith separate from your work, worried that pursuing your God-given dreams might be seen as selfish or misguided. For far too long, we've been held back by a world that tells us that faith and ambition don't mix, that our divinely inspired visions are just wishful thinking. But here's what I've discovered. Our faith isn't a liability in our leadership. As a matter of fact, it's the source of our strength and wisdom. When we fully integrate our leadership with our Christian values, then and only then do we tap into that unshakable divine power. The real challenge is navigating how to boldly pursue our purpose while staying anchored in our faith. And that's exactly what The Beacon Show is all about. Each week, we bring you biblical wisdom and practical strategies from true beacons, Christian leaders who are illuminating the world. And it's also that you can let your light shine brighter and brighter. I'm Tamara Jackson, and this is The Beacon Show. If God has given you a vision, there is no time like the present to get to work. Today's guest is a shining example of what can happen when we choose to follow God's call without delay. Dr. Bob Dudley is a motivational speaker, an evangelist, and number one international best-selling author with an almost unbelievable journey of perseverance and God's provision. Growing up in the projects of Los Angeles, Bob faced countless challenges from gangs to drugs to homelessness and family instability. But a divine encounter at a Bible camp set him on a transformational path. Since then, Dr. Dudley has gone from high school dropout to rocket scientist, earning five college degrees, building successful businesses, and impacting tens of thousands of lives through his ministry. But beyond the impressive resume, it's Bob's wholehearted pursuit of God's call that truly sets him apart. Now he's on a mission to equip the next generation of Christian leaders through the launch of Wise Bible College in Orlando. With a pioneering model that combines practical evangelism training, entrepreneurial skills, and strategic partnerships, Bob envisions a prototype for Bible colleges of the future. In this inspiring conversation, Bob shares jaw-dropping stories of God's miraculous provision, hard-won wisdom from hearing from heaven, and a contagious passion for the urgency of the gospel. He also opens up about the power of faithful mentors, the importance of working in community, and living the key to living with no plan B faith. If you've ever doubted God's ability to use your past for his purpose, felt daunted by the size of your God-given dreams, or simply needed a reminder that the harvest is ripe and the time is now, this episode is for you. Get ready to have your faith ignited and your vision expanded. Grab a notebook, put on your seatbelt, and let's get ready to dive into this unforgettable conversation with the one and only Dr. Bob Dudley. Enjoy. Welcome everyone to The Beacon Show, where wisdom meets faith and success finds its voice. We have a very special guest with us today, and this is going to be an exciting um, educational interview. So I'm really looking forward to having you meet my guest today, Bob Dudley. Bob, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tamara. Really well, appreciate it. Yeah. You know, we've got a chance to get to know each other a little bit over the last couple of months. And mm -hmm. You've got some really exciting projects that you're working on, but I always like to start at the beginning and learn a little bit more about the person, how they grew up, um, and what they saw as the vision for their life at that time. So can you take us back um, to your childhood? Sure. Uh, well, let's go all the way back to the beginning. And uh, it was a pretty rough life starting. I was uh, born 1957. My uh, mom, as a teenager, was dating this man in his 30s. And they uh, wound up getting pregnant, and then they got married. So back then they were, you know, they did the right thing. Then they got me, and then uh, within a year they got divorced. And I've never seen my father. Uh, my mom and him split up. Don't even know why they split up. They did. So uh, we grew up in the projects in, in the south side of Los Angeles, and uh, it was a lifestyle where if the rent got too far overdue, we would move to a new place and start over again and, mm -hmm. and, and leave them high and dry. And uh, because of that, it, during my, my uh, life in school, I went to 17 different schools before finally, as a senior in high school, I dropped out. And, uh, and that was pretty much my life. I, I can remember 
one time even, I was probably, I don't know, 10 years old. I had a younger brother and sister at the time. And the the routine was my mom would drop us off at the babysitter. She would make sure we had breakfast and went to school. The babysitter did. And then we'd come home, play at their house, do our homework, whatever. And then my mother would come home from work. She was a telephone operator back when they had operators. Yeah. And uh, pick us up and the next day would repeat. Well, there was a Wednesday that she dropped us off, but never came back. And uh, Thursday came and no mom. Friday mm. came and no mom. She finally, the, the babysitter got a hold of some sort of social services from the times. And uh, they found uh, my mom's sister, my aunt Pat, and we wound up moving into her house for the next year. Hmm. I still, to this day, have no idea where my mother disappeared to, what happened. She just left. And uh, she came, and that happened twice in my life. Hmm. And uh, because of the environment we were in, by the time I was 12 years old, I fell into a gang. And uh, like I was telling you uh, earlier, that was the first time I ever shot at another person. Thank God I'm a horrible shot because <laughs> uh, I missed and nothing happened. But uh, by this time, my mom had remarried uh, twice. She was married to a gentleman, Andy, now my second stepdad. And they talked and decided that I could not stay in that environment. Mm. So we moved to from Los Angeles to Worcester, Massachusetts, where my stepfather was from. And while we were there, uh, me and my uh, brother and sister had to live in Vermont with his sister while they looked for houses and and and, uh, and jobs and that thing. Well, my aunt Barbara had uh, had a had a law: if you're going to be in her house, you have to go to church. Ah. Now I grew up Catholic, <laughs> and uh, and I and I say CEO Catholic, Christmas and Easter, all <laughs> faithfully in church. Twice I got to remember year. that. Yeah. So uh, so Baptists turns out go to church a lot more than <laughs> CEO Catholics do. We went Sunday morning, Sunday night, mm. Wednesday night, and oh, yeah. we threw up on Friday night. And and I'm just overwhelmed because by this time mm-hmm. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any of that. Wow. So uh, she then announces we're out in the country. They had a maple tree farm out mm-hmm. in Vermont. That she announces we're going to Bible camp. I had no idea what camp Bible was. Bible camp was yeah. right. <laughs> it was. Uh, <clears throat> turns out you do Sunday school in the mornings. Uh. You play sports in the afternoons, and they bring in these guest speakers at night. Ah, okay. Well, that Wednesday night, they brought in this gentleman. Turns out he was an evangelist. I mm. didn't know what that was, but that's what he was. Yeah. And uh, he spoke, don't remember what he was saying. I sat way in the back with the other problem children. And uh, at the end, we stand up and they sing a, a song. And he asks a question I never heard before. He says, are you 100% sure if you died mm. today that you would go, go to heaven? heaven? Yeah. And up until that very fraction of a second, I did not believe there was a heaven. I didn't believe there was a God. Hmm. But when he said that, tears started streaming down my face. Mm. I knew there was a God. I knew there was a heaven. And I knew I wasn't going. Wow. So I got out of my seat and I started walking to the front and found out later that I had an entourage. My aunt, my uncle, and my cousin, (laughs) all my friends that had been praying for me, followed me to the front. Oh, that's awesome. I got down on my knees and a pastor took out a Bible and showed me how I could know that I could have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Mm. And I committed my life to God. And, uh, and started down a new path. Now, my f- parents thought I'd gotten squared away now, so they decide <laughs> we're moving back to California mm. and uh, where my gangs were and where mm-hmm. the people that got me in trouble the first time were, and I fell back into that. Yeah. And uh, uh, I remember, now I'm getting close to my senior year in high school. We wound up, I was in my third high, my third high school mm. of that year. And uh, I went into the counselor and they said, you have to take the year over again, but if you quit, you st- you'll be a high school dropout and you'll have to go to night school or something. I says, well, if I got to take it over, why stay? He says, well, that's just the rule. I says, well, I don't like the rule and I left. Mm. So I dropped out of high school. I left home and I slept near dumpsters and alleys in Los Angeles and mm. just lived on the streets for a while. And uh, I wasn't very good at that. And mm. I was getting hungry and I was looking for a way out. <laughs> and I thought, well, I know where I can get food and, and housing and get away from all this um, uh, leadership stuff that's yeah. oppressing me. And I joined the army. <laughs> got yeah. More leadership. Oh, yeah. It, okay. Got more authority. <laughs> so I went in the army. I uh, got my uh, uh, GED and I got my high school diploma mm. uh, in Korea, actually. And then, uh, and w- but it was during Vietnam, but I got to go to Korea. And then uh, I was stationed at Fort Ord, California. And uh, 
I was got back in church, and when I was getting ready to get out of the army, the uh, my pastor asked me what I was going to do. I says, "Well, I think I'll go to college." He says, uh, "Do you have a major?" I says, "No, I don't know yet." He says, "Well, why don't you go to Bible college while you figure it out?" Hmm. I said, "Okay, that sounds like a good idea." So I went where he went because I didn't know where to find mm -hmm. a Bible college. He yeah. went to uh, Midwestern Baptist College in Pontiac, Michigan. Mm -hmm. So I took my my wife and now one daughter to Pontiac and uh, started going to Midwestern Baptist College. Went for a year and a half and decided that it really wasn't for me. I just mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to serve God somehow, but I didn't. Uh, me and the the college didn't jive very well. Yeah. So I wound up quitting, and then. Uh, that night, I went to the, my factory job. I was working, uh, making parts for cars uh, and got home about midnight. And I'm sitting out in the driveway in my car and I start crying because I see my life going the same path that my parents went. And I saw me either working in a factory or being on welfare. I grew up on welfare most of my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want that lifestyle to be what my daughters have. So I learned later in life, what I was in the process of doing was breaking a generational curse. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know that. I didn't have yeah. a vocabulary for that. So, but that's, that's what was happening that night. God laid on my heart to go to the local university the next day and sign up for a degree. And I had no idea what I was going to study. And he wasn't telling me. So the next day I go ahead and I go to the university. It's Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. And I go into the registrar's office and I say, I want, to get a, I want to get a degree. And she says, what do you want to major in? I says, I don't know. I just need a degree. <laughs> she kind of rolled her eyes and handed me the book and says, well, look up something. You can always change your mind later. I said, okay. So I'm thumbing through it. And I kind of hear God's voice saying, get the hardest thing in there. Hmm. And I'm, I'm like, what, what is that? And he says, you'll know it when you see it. So I'm thumbing through and I see this word pops out on this page and I'm thinking, that looks hard. I don't know what it is, what they do, but that looks hard. I looked at the lady and I says, I wanted to get, I want to get a degree in physics. And she's like, okay. <laughs> and uh, Definitely hard, guys. <laughs> yeah, seriously, right? And uh, so I sign up. I have to take a math placement test. Hmm. Uh, I hung out behind the gym during math. <laughs> Because it turns out you have to take this class called calculus, yeah, which I could barely pronounce then <laughs> before you do your physics, physics right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I had to take algebra one and algebra two and analytic functions and trigonometry before I could take my calculus class. Wow. So I'm way behind already. Mm -hmm. uh, I find out that the Bible college was not accredited. So all the, the math and, and English and history and, and all of those general education classes, I had to do all of them all over again. Hmm. Plus, by now I have a wife and two children yeah. that I have to feed and house, so I couldn't quit the factory. I still had to work 40 hours a day, a week rather, mm -hmm. uh, in the factory. And uh, things went great. First year, I made the honor roll, uh, both semesters. Second year, same thing. Uh, just before my third year starts, there's a knock on my door of the apartment, and I open the door, and now I'm in Michigan. And, and let me say, when you're putting your pass behind you and they're like 2,000 miles away... <laughs> Fairly easy yeah, to do. Yeah, you're thinking I'm good here. I'm good. I can do this, right? <laughs> I open the door and it's my mom, my second stepdad, and my six now six brothers and sisters moving in with me. Unbelievable! Isn't that crazy? Unbelievable. And uh, and uh, we were on the second floor of a duplex. It was un over under duplex. We lived on the second floor. The owner lived on the first floor. Mm. So it was like a week before we got kicked out because there was the four in my family mm. and their eight. So we got 12 people living in a two-bedroom apartment. So we, 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 we go out and we find, my folks find a place. And then I decide that I just can't be in that environment anymore. I get a, mm -hmm. a small apartment. And uh, bottom line, I wound up graduating in three years with oh honors God. at the top of my class. And uh, it was just God. God's amazing. You just do what he says mm -hmm. and follow the plan he leaves. Leave success up to him. Uh, Proverbs 21, 31 is one of my favorite verses mm. in my wife's life first. It says, prepare the horse for battle, mm. but victory belongs to the Lord. Yeah. So if you're teaming up with God, you both have a responsibility. Your responsibility is to do what he says, yes. which is stay in his word and follow his lead. Mm. His responsibility is to make it successful. And if you mm. can take that load off of your shoulders and give it to him, it's amazing what you can accomplish in life.
you know, as I listen to you share, and, and I know the the audience that's watching or listening is is blown away by your story, but it, it's such a testament that where you start um, doesn't have to be where things up when 100%. you when you team up with when you team up with God and you yes. surrender to His will and His plan mm-hmm. for your life. So you go through this amazing journey, you surrender. He blesses everything that you've mm-hmm. touched in your college journey. Where do you go next from there? Oh, wow. Okay. So I, I dropped out of high school, went in the army, got my GED, and now I have a degree in physics. <laughs> the funny thing is people hire doctors in physics, not a bachelor's. Mm, I so, see. <laughs> uh, and I'm running out of money, hmm. so I got to do something. And actually, I had looked at doing nuclear subs in the Navy. That was kind of in my head. Didn't do it, but that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And then just before I'm getting ready to sign the paperwork, we're walking through the mall. And you know how they have those kiosks in the the big hallways? They had the Air Force there. And the Air Force guy says, nah, don't go in the Navy. He says, I got a deal for you. You got a physics degree. I will get you commissioned. You'll go to college for a year and a half to get a bachelor's in aerospace engineering. And Mm. then you'll start working. And you'll just owe yeah. us four years for that. Okay. So I, thought, I could get another degree. Yeah. Why right. Not? So, uh, so, and then during physics, and I'm trying to figure out what I am going to do with my life, things about space and, and stuff like that kept popping in my head. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what it meant, what I was going to do with it, but hmm. this was kind of like a, a, a sign. So mm-hmm. I did. I signed up for the Air Force. They sent me to San Antonio, Texas to become what they call a 90-day wonder. I become a second <laughs> lieutenant. And uh, I spend my whole time as a second lieutenant and uh, part of my time as a first lieutenant going to Parks College of St. Louis University, one of the top aerospace colleges mm-hmm. in the nation. And uh, me, what they had, it was called a lateral degree uh, program. They took uh, physicists and chemists and mathematicians and turned them into different types of engineers. Mm-hmm. And uh, ours happened to be aerospace engineering. Well, there was another physicist there. And uh, the two of us found that engineering school was easy, believe it or not. So we played ping pong all day. Both of (laughs) us graduated magna cum laude (laughs) with, uh, I was top of the class and he was second. And all we do is play ping pong and do the homework. (laughs) Uh, Pretty amazing. (laughs) So yeah, so then it gets better. Then I get sent to um, San Bernardino, California, where I... Uh, work on the Reagan administration's uh, MX missile system called a Peacekeeper. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I worked on the nuclear package in the interface with the missile. Mm -hmm. Did that for a couple of years. Then they decided to send me to graduate school Mm -hmm. to a place called the Air Force Institute of Technology, which is uh, number three astronautical engineering Mm -hmm. school in the country. So they sent me there to get my master's in astronautical engineering. Uh, And then uh, I go and work uh, for a couple of years on Russian and Chinese missiles. And then they sent me to the, uh, and this blows me away. They sent me to the United States Naval Academy to be a professor. I'm hmm. thinking if they knew my background, <laughs> they would. Who let this guy in here? Let him, <laughs> yeah. Why are we even letting him talk to the students, let alone teaching them something? So I got to do that. And it turned out to be the coolest assignment I ever had in the military. Mm. And let me tell you why. Why? As an Air Force officer, if you teach at one of the academies, you have to do academics, which is why you were brought there. Mm-hmm. You have to do something in the athletics and then you have to do something in leadership. Well, athletics is a whole nother hour story. I was a professional martial artist uh, and kickboxer. I fought in the ring for several years okay. in my spare time. And uh, I also taught Army Special Forces in hand-to-hand. And I uh, was on the U.S. Taekwondo team and the Army Taekwondo team. So I was When did you sleep, Bob? I'd never slept. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I'm taking a nap later. Uh, and, and so that was fun. And then leadership, the Navy does leadership on ships. Well, I'm in the Air Force. I've been on a cruise ship, but that's about it. That's the only thing I know about ships. Well, I asked my um, students what it was all about. And they said, well, there's two different programs you can work in and and work with us. One they called Gray Halls. It looked like uh, PT-109 or McHale's Navy Mm. Gray Hall boats that was really – Navy-ish, like mm-hmm. you did everything Navy on it. They said, if you really want to learn about how the Navy works, do that. Then they also had these 44-foot sloops, sailboats. Mm. Uh, and they and uh, they said, if you want to have fun, do the sailboats. Oh. So it was a no-brainer. I did the sailboats, right? <laughs> of course. Yeah. And check it out. They sent me, 
I spent every afternoon for an entire year sailing on the Chesapeake Bay. That Seriously? was my job. Wow. Right? I, I got paid <laughs> You had that. a hookup for sure. I had a hookup. <laughs> so we, I, I get checked out. I do okay. I know how to do celestial navigation, how to patch the sail, how to, they called it a latrine. I called it the toilet downstairs. Um, I, all of it and, and sail and, and all that. I checked out. Now I'm ready to train midshipmen. Hmm. The way they do that is they have uh, two officers, two seniors that are learning leadership, and then two uh, uh, eight sophomores that are going to be the crew. Mm-hmm. So we do that for a whole year now again, and the checkout for them, their final exam, is to sail from Annapolis to Bermuda and back mm. out in the open ocean. How long? Five days. Yeah. It takes Sounds a whole like a day to get out of the Chesapeake and then four mm. days on the ocean. So it was going to be okay. We're ready to do that. And and the plan was we would take five days to get there. We would go scuba diving for five days because we are scuba divers. And <laughs> Love it, it. Light, right? In paradise. And then five days back. Well, we're loading up the boat and uh, it starts sprinkling. Mm. And we look at the weather and it doesn't look like it's going to be too bad. So we decide we're going to keep going. Mm-hmm. We get everything loaded up that morning. We get in the boat and we get 24 hours later, we're at the mouth of the Chesapeake drenched and Uh-oh. it's just pouring oh no but we still decide to keep going mm. we got four more days all right and the way we do it is we have um, one crew me and the senior and four midshipmen are one crew and then the other crew uh, we're going out it's like two days out to sea all right so we're out three days two days out in the middle of the ocean and a tropical storm hits oh no with hurricane force winds <gasps> and uh we have a 44 foot boat 68 foot mast and the swells were higher than the mast. No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh my. And uh, we are like, when you're on the deck, we're tied in now. Mm. So if we get washed overboard, we can pull the person back up. And that didn't happen once. And mm. you would go up the swell and uh, you were sure the boat was going to tip over and go upside. And then you would go get over it and you would go down and half the boat would, would go underwater and pop back up and bob like a little cork. And, uh, and this is going on for hours and hours. What are you thinking at this point? That this is it. This is it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you get close to God. I bet. Yeah. So we're going. And then finally, we're supposed to be like now maybe a day out away from Bermuda. We've been doing this for 24 hours now. And it's two in the morning and I'm at the helm. And all of a sudden, the waves just stop and they go flat. And the compass on top of the helm starts circling. It's just circling in the, mm. and then all the lights flicker on the boat and all the electronics go out. So now we're <gasps> in the Bermuda Triangle. With again. nothing. <laughs> I no, oh, God. Yeah, no engine, no Ooh. wind. Everything's done. And it's still overcast. All we can see is the moon. So we take our sextants out and we're going to calculate where we are. Hmm. Well, you really need stars. The moon isn't very accurate. So we're like, last location, we were 60 some miles from Bermuda. We can get a location that's plus or minus 80 some miles. So it's totally useless. Oh, We're wow. either, you're either going to hit right smack into Bermuda and the corals and sink, or you're going to miss. It's very low island because it's built on corals. You're going to miss it and go to Africa. So... We're like, no. What do you do? Yeah, what do we do? So we said, all right, we're just going to follow the moon, like where it is. We're just going to keep it there and keep going and see what happens. Well, Mm. a couple hours later, the compass stops spinning. The lights flicker and come back on. And then we make it to Bermuda. We scuba dive for five days and we have barbecues. Get out of here. No way. (laughs) Barbecues all the way back. On the boat. Yeah, we just barbecued on the deck and it was just a (gasps) party. But You've had so many almost unbelievable experiences looking back how do you see god's handiwork through all of that well you know it's interesting um at the time you think you're just doing something a lot of times you don't even ask god if that's what you should do you just Mm. do it right so i um you know we'll talk about the college here soon but it's a double major in evangelism and entrepreneurialism and uh my entrepreneurial journey started when i was getting my physics degree i needed some more money so i opened Mm. up a karate studio yeah and uh, I put down pads and mirrors and all the trappings of a studio. And I was going to teach martial arts because I figured I was pretty good at that. And three months later, I closed it down without a single student. I'm like, what in the world? And this is in Michigan. So I, I get in the Air Force and I wind up in California. And I'm having lunch with one of the contractors that worked for our office. And he says, Bob, I just wanted to let you know I'm quitting. I'm going to become an entrepreneur. 
I said, well, I tried that. It's not for me, right? Mm. So he asked me all sorts of questions about my business. He never once asked me about martial arts, but asked me about branding <laughs> and PR ah. and sales mm -hmm. and, and all the business stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm like, I never even heard any of that, mm. right? So I went back and tried my hand at the martial arts studios again, and I grew one of the largest studios in Southern California mm. in two years because now I knew how to run a business. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, I went from knowing a thing, whatever product or service you give, to mm -hmm. knowing the thing that's called your business. business yes. And it made all the difference in the world. And at the time, I didn't know that that would become important to me. But now it's critically mm. important to what, I'm, uh, what I've been doing the last several years yeah. and getting ready to do. So uh, I, um, one of the things, I, I made a commitment with myself, m with my 20 years in the military. Every time I transferred, I would learn something new. Mm. So one of the times, uh, and I had been divorced now and uh, I decided I wanted to learn how to dance, ballroom dance. And then I wound up being an Arthur Murray instructor for 15 years, my last 15 years in the military. <laughs> and uh, one of the things we learn in Arthur Murray's is how to sell because you're selling dance lessons mm. and they're very expensive. Yeah. Very expensive. So if you can sell that, you could sell, sell anything. anything. That's right. right. <laughs> so I learned how to be a very good salesman. Mm. And then I became an evangelist and an entrepreneur with several different companies. And that came in yeah. handy. And I didn't know that at the time. I just thought I was mm. learning a social skill. Yeah. yeah. So so is part of the lesson for those that are, are watching and, and listening to us today to be willing to try new things and oh. see where it leads? Absolutely. And I would not say, a lot of people say, you know, success is right on the other side of your comfort zone. Maybe it is, but I think success is on the other side of you being willing to learn the lessons that God wants to teach you. Mm -hmm. and just stepping out and try something new, try something yeah. different. You know, if it, if it works for you, great, keep doing it. If it doesn't work for you, put that in the box of let's not do this as ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm curious though, how would you, you know, make that decision? Like, do you have a certain period of time that you give something to see if it yields fruit before you decide, nah, maybe I should stop this and do something else? Like, give us the um, wisdom of, of how to discern. Well, when I think, it's <laughs> see, that's a great question. But I think part of the problem is that at the time, especially when we're younger, we're not even thinking, is this something God wants me to do? Yeah, that's but true. God knows, and mm. He's probably nudged you in that direction. So, unless it's something unethical or illegal, yeah, it could be something that God you just wants know. to train yeah. you. You don't even know. I mean, look mm -hmm. at look at King David. He was a shepherd. I mean, if you want to learn lessons on being a leader, be mm. a shepherd. Now, he <laughs> had no idea he was going to be king. Wasn't even aspiring to that. Yeah. He was probably thinking, "I'll be a shepherd the rest of my life." Mm. But God used that. Yeah. Right. He used the fact that he killed what a, a lion and a bear mm -hmm. with a slingshot yeah. to yeah. conquer Goliath. So and he, and and you know that type of mundane job is probably very boring. Hmm. Being well, you know, uh, and having your own business, and I'm sure being king, there's some exciting times. But I would say ninety percent of it's boring. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's the hard part too, right? Is right. staying faithful to something when it's not as exciting. You know, mm -hmm. there's parts of it, as you said that you really enjoy, um, that you really see God's hand mm -hmm. in. Yeah. And then there's the day in, the day out grind, if you will, mm -hmm. of the fundamentals of a business that right. you learn that you have to do in order for the vision that God has given you to come exactly. to be. And if David hadn't have spent that time out in the fields doing that, who knows how antsy he would be and how uh, mm. you know ready to go, let's go start another war or yeah. whatever. Yeah, you got it's it's training, right? It's training. All of it is training, and yeah. one of the things that I have learned about God, and maybe you have seen it in your life too, is there's nothing wasted. That's what I hear. That's right. When I listen to yes. your story, is He uses all of it. We mm -hmm. are not always able to make sense of it. Yes. But the skills that you learn selling ballroom dancing now help you win souls to Christ. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 I. Like I said, I never knew that at the time. But as you're learning skills, no matter what it is you're doing in life, don't throw those away just because you left that job. Mm. Because you probably were doing that job because God's got something big lined up for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. He's training you for what is next. Yeah. So you have this amazing career in the military mm -hmm. and all these part-time things when you have spare time <laughs> running different <laughs> businesses, teaching, ballroom dancing, mm -hmm. all of these amazing things. Where are you now at this season of your life? What is your latest focus? All right. Well, uh, let's do it this way. About 20 years ago, 
I go forward in church and I tell God, I'll do whatever you want. You just have to let me know what it is. Yeah. And believe it or not, God takes you serious when you ask <laughs> Be careful what you ask Th- God that's for. Right. <laughs> Before I got home, I had an uncontrollable urge to tell people about Christ. Mm. Now, I'm probably in my early 50s at this mo- at that point, maybe late 40s. And I got saved when I was 14, and I could count on two fingers the people I led to Christ over that whole span, right? So mm-hmm. I'm thinking, uh, is this really God? Because this is just not right. I don't, right. I don't know. Huh? And I told Kathy, my wife, I says, here's what God wants me to do. Go out and tell people about Jesus. And her exact words were, well, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a vote of confidence. <laughs> She, didn't say, she says, okay, here's the thing. I'll support you, but never expect me to talk to anybody like that. Mm. So we're living in Maryland in one of the suburbs of D.C. So Annapolis isn't very far away. And it's a big tourist area. A lot of yachts come mm-hmm. there and whatnot. Yes. A lot Thank of you. shops to go into. So I thought, well, that'd be a great place to go talk to people. So Friday night, we go down there and we walk around the harbor for like two hours. And I don't talk to anybody. I'm just too scared. Mm, to nervous. Yeah. I'm a, I'm, I spent my life as a scientist and an en- engineer. I'm a nerd. Yeah. yeah. I'm comfortable in front of a <laughs> computer, right. right? So I go down there, don't talk to anybody. So I'm all mad at myself, kicking myself. We drive home. I say, okay, next week, I'm really going to do, do it. it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we do it next week and the next week and the next week. Six months, I went down there every Friday. Six months, I never talked to No. Person. Seriously? Yeah. And finally, I think God's got a sense of humor because hmm. finally he, he, I, I hear this voice in my head say, you know, there's people that will teach you how to do this. <laughs> like, yeah, could have told me that six months ago because I want to see if you're serious. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly yeah. it, yeah. right? Because many people, mm-hmm. they would have deemed that it wasn't successful because they didn't complete the assignment that they had in their mind to do. That's right. So then they would have said, well, I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah, I can't I do it. Yeah, I must whatever, I can't right. do it. But Maybe you didn't complete what you thought the assignment was, but you were obedient enough to keep Mm -hmm. going to the place and to keep believing Mm -hmm. that this is going to be the week that I do it. This will be it. This is it. So I found found an outreach pastor Hmm. and uh, I followed him around for 12 weeks. And at the same time, Kathy's following this lady around from this church that they had a very robust evangelism program. So I watched him lead people to Christ every single week. Mm. Some laughing, some neutral, some bawling their eyes out, Mm -hmm. and just the whole gambit. And I watched him and I see just how easy it is. One of the things I learned from him is witnessing is the easiest and the hardest thing you can do. Mm. Hardest because you don't know how to get on the topic. You Mm. you, you feel like you've got to win them to Christ. But easiest because getting on the topic, it turns out, is is trainable and very easy. Mm. And you realize that it's your job to convey, but it's God's job to convict, Mm -hmm. right? So you just talk. You don't have to have any special powers or Mm. whatever. And God does all the work. And, And you can see in scriptures where when you're witnessing, it's you and Jesus standing next to you, God the Father over it, the Holy Spirit working on that person's heart. And you've got a book that is supernatural. Hmm. Let, me, let me tell you this quick story. Yeah. Uh, eventually, we were working this ministry that did, uh, we had these booths at fairs and carnivals and craft shows where people would come in and hear the gospel, mm-hmm. right? And we would invite them to accept Christ. Well, we were at this one in uh, Springfield, Ohio. Uh, that week, it turned out over a thousand people came to Christ. Uh, in particular, this one teenage girl, and I, by this time, had raised four teenage daughters, so I knew a teenage girl attitude. Right? <laughs> mm-hmm. So this girl comes in and sits down. We have a sign that says, free gift with a message, and it's this yardstick with um, these guys on it, these bracelets, hmm. the, the gospel, okay. right? So um, I go, she sits down, and uh, and and she's rolling her eyes while I'm trying to make conversation. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm like, and, and my thought is, let me guy. get her out as fat, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get her out of here as fast as I can mm. so I can get somebody in that's serious and cares, mm. right? Yeah. So, um, and, and when we teach people to go through the gospel, we have them do a verse and then give an illustration, make sure they understand. Then to the next verse, we do four verses, the Romans road. So the first verse is, um, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Mm-hmm. She goes, yeah, whatever. That's ex- like, and whatever. like that, right? Wow. Yeah, whatever. And then the next verse is, and, and I'm thinking, I'm getting through this. You know, the shortest gospel presentation was, was Jonah through Nineveh. It's like, repent or you're going to die. <laughs> right. right. So 
So I'm trying to beat that record. <laughs> and uh, so I go through the gospel super fast. And at the end, I say, would you like to accept Christ as your savior? Basically, what I say is, if Jesus is willing to accept you just the way you are, and he is, mm -hmm. would you be willing to accept him and trust him yeah. as your only way to heaven? And she goes, yeah. And uh, so typically, I do the sinner's prayer, and I have yeah. them repeat it out loud. Well, she's not saying anything. But I'm holding her hands for some mm -hmm. reason while we're praying. And as a good Baptist, I got my eyes closed. <laughs> And uh, and I open them and I look down and she hasn't said a word. I just said the prayer out loud and mm. nothing. And her the backs of her hands are wet. I'm like, I'm what crying. in the world? I look up and she's bawling. She's crying. She is yeah. crying. For five minutes, she's squeezing my hands, just bawling her eyes out. Mm. And finally she goes, Jesus really loves me. The book is supernatural. All I did was quote verses to her. And, and her heart, her, it sounded like her heart was so hard in the beginning. Yeah. And you right. could have easily just been like, well, this isn't working. I'm out of uh -huh. here. <laughs> yeah. So I gave the worst gospel presentation mm. with the worst attitude in my entire life. And Jesus still, still. used, the Holy Spirit still used his words to mm. reach into her heart and soften it. Mm. And now you are equipping others I to am. bring people yes. to Christ. Tell us about that. Okay. Well, um, I eventually started traveling the world and running out of my own money. Mm -hmm. So I tried going to churches to raise funds and I'm spending 30,000 on a trip because I'm taking a team of five or 10 men and women mm -hmm. with me. So when you go to churches getting $25 a month, it takes a long oh, time to be able to do. Yeah. So I wind up and a whole nother story. Maybe we talk about it another time, uh, flipping houses and doing rental properties. Mm -hmm. Uh, matter of fact, I had hired Robert Kiyosaki to teach me. It cost me yeah. like sixty thousand dollars. I bet. <laughs> and in five years, I made three million. Easily and worth the investment. Easily. <laughs> at, the, at the time, Kathy's like, oh, I don't know. Mm. Oh, speaking of which, remember she said that was weird. Yeah. Uh, this that was twenty years ago. She has now led one on one, like we're talking, over twenty thousand <laughs> people to Christ. <laughs> well, she now will have me stop the car <laughs> if somebody's begging on the mm. side of the road, and she'll get out and witness to them and pray with them and then come back in the car and we'll go on. What a testament to how yes. God can change us. So I put all that together to say, we're now building a college here in Orlando called Wise Bible College. Mm. And it has a double major, a major in evangelism and a major in entrepreneurial studies. Mm. And, the, and the whole point of the school is, uh, I had graduated, after I was done being a rocket scientist, I went to one seminary and got a bachelor's, another one got a doctorate. And then I was a professor at Washington Bible College. I learned that there was three things missing in Bible colleges, three gaps. One was in personal evangelism. They don't teach it. They just, I guess, assume you know assume or whatever. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what Wise Bible College is going to do is evangelism is going to be a way of life. Every week they have to go out for three or four hours and share the gospel, either on the streets or knocking on doors or nursing homes or whatever. But they have to do that. Because when they graduate, I want it to be second nature that you sit down, say, in a restaurant, the waitress takes your order and you say something to the waiter and you say something like, we're getting ready to pray for our meals. Mm. How can we pray for you? Mm. And that opens up the door. I've had, I've had waiters and waitresses sit down in the bench next to us and start crying just because we asked to pray wow. for them. And then their heart's ready to talk about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So I want that to be second nature to the graduates. Not something that they have to kind of figure out and maybe make it work after they get out. Mm -hmm. All right. And then at the same time, uh, another problem, a lot of my friends that I went to seminary with, they would graduate. And then if they were going to be a missionary or uh, you know, a church planner or something like that, they'd have to go out for like two, three, four years, maybe five years and raise support. Mm -hmm. So they graduate and it's still way in the future before well, they, they can, can start actually, serving yeah. God the way they felt. Mm -hmm. I think that's the sin of the church. I mm -hmm. think the day you graduate, there should be the um, supplies available for you to step into ministry then, mm -hmm. right? Not have to go out and raise it. Yeah. And then the, the, the third thing I find wrong with churches, with the schools today is, um, you know, when I did the martial arts studio I talked about earlier, I, I knew how to teach karate. I knew how to fight, but it was a failure because I only knew how to do the product mm -hmm. or the service that's there. Not the business. I didn't know how to do the business. Mm -hmm. When you get... When you go to Bible college and seminary, they teach you how to preach. They teach yeah. you how to study the Bible. I can read Greek and Hebrew, but the I didn't business. know from there anything about running the business. Yeah. And you know that the average time a person is in ministry, man or woman is in ministry, is five years before they quit out of frustration. Mm. And maybe it wasn't God's will because I ain't making it work. Yeah. So uh, there's no business. So what we're doing with the double majors is the evangelist major 
they get to make it second nature. And then their junior senior project is to actually run a Billy Graham style crusade yeah. where the juniors are responsible for all the, the, the PR and the marketing and everything leading up to the crusade. And then the seniors are responsible for actually running it from security to worship team to ushers to who's preaching, mm -hmm. what churches are going to help with the follow up, all yeah. of that. So and what that does is it takes what they've learned on the evangelism side and apply it and what they've learned on the business side and apply it to ministry. Mm -hmm. All right. And then on the, the business side, in order to graduate after four years, they have to have a business that's viable and will support them and their family and their ministry. So the day after graduation, if they want to, they can step into business. Mm -hmm. And we see two types of students coming. We see those that want to be in ministry and, and have this side hustle or whatever you want to call it mm -hmm. to support them. Yeah. Or we have also students that want to go in the marketplace and partner with God in what they're doing uh, to serve yeah. the, the community you know, with their secular business with God on board. So let's talk about that because, you know, many times when you think about serving God, the path that's mm -hmm. talked about most often is serving in ministry. So right. I'm working in a church or maybe I'm doing missions or maybe I have a, a nonprofit mm -hmm. that's right. a Christian, you know, uh, objective, right? Right. But you are saying that I can go into the marketplace mm -hmm. and I can still serve God. Talk to us about why yeah. that's important. That's a very good topic because my success coaching company was for young Christian entrepreneurs. And one of the big questions always was, what's a godly business look like? Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a meme out there, and not that I get my theology from memes, maybe a little bit. <laughs> but it was a, a guy designing his business card. And Jesus sitting there next to him, and, and, and the guy says, I think I'm going to put a silhouette of you on, on my business card so people know I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. He says, Jesus says, well, let's do this. Why don't we leave it off and see if they can figure They'll it out? Figure it out. Yes. You know? yes, 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 right? yes. So, uh, so what does it mean to have a godly business? Well, I wrote a book called God's Partner, and it's all about the fact that a godly business is what you and God decide it is. Mm -hmm. So my godly business may be completely different than yeah. yours. As a matter of fact, I own several companies. Uh, one of them uh, does rental properties, and I have property managers running it. So my end client doesn't even know no. who I am, let alone I'm a Christian, right, right? Right. So they don't know what that godly business is. I take 10% of everything we make, and, mm. and I support um, evangelists around the world, Yeah. right? I have another business uh, that is Life Changers 180 that does coaching. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely they know that I'm a Christian. When I do my conferences, I don't assume everybody in the room is a Christian. We give a gospel presentation every day, mm -hmm. right? So that's one. And then, of course, I'm starting a school 100% serving other Christians. So what a godly business is to you may not be what it is to me. But what it is is something that you and God decided on. And, and uh, if I could do this, here's how I have my clients do it. They fill out what's called a, a joint venture agreement. Mm -hmm. I used to do those a lot when I was flipping houses and I would get people to invest. We would do yeah. that. What a joint venture agreement does has three parts. It has the goal of the agreement, and the agreement can be between people or companies or a mixture of that or whatever. So it has what our goals are, mm -hmm. and then it has roles and responsibilities. What am I supposed to do versus what are you supposed to do? And then it has compensation. What do I get out of it? What do you get out of it? Right? Yeah. So I talk about, let's do that with God. Now- Goals are pretty easy. The first goal is whatever dream you put on your heart. You know you're doing that. But the second you partner with him, he adds two more goals. Of course. <laughs> yeah. And they're really cool ones too because they have nothing to do with your business and everything to do with you and him. Mm. And it is, uh, it's found in Matthew and it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God yes. and his righteousness, two different things, mm -hmm. and all these things will be added onto you. So what right. he wants is he wants you to do this business so that you can grow God's kingdom, mm -hmm. whatever that means between you and him, and which is seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He wants you to become more and more and more like his son, mm -hmm. right? So those are the three goals of the company. Grow the kingdom, you get closer to God, mm -hmm. and then whatever dream he put on your heart to go out and do in the world. Yeah. Now, roles and responsibilities. That goes back to that Proverbs twenty one thirty one. My role and responsibility is to do whatever he says. Just and that simple. Just And it's that simple. And you know, here's the cool thing. Um, my next book is called um, Conquering Your Promised Land, and it's a study of hmm. Joshua yeah. as it relates One to business. One of my favorite Bible characters. Oh, I love man, Joshua. he's just amazing. And you know, God says to him in the very first uh, chapter, 
I think it's verse eight or nine, the secret to success mm-hmm. is not being a good business person. No. It's knowing God's word yeah. and keeping Meditating. it in there, mm-hmm. meditating on his word, yeah. right? And all through the Bible, that's the first place I've read it, but mm-hmm. all through the Bible, that's the secret to success. It's mm-hmm. just follow him, follow his word, memorize it, draw closer to him. So that's my role and responsibility. Mm-hmm. His, according to Proverbs twenty one thirty one, is to make it successful. We talked mm-hmm. about that. So when you can take, as an entrepreneur, if you can take the responsibility of success off your shoulders and just mm-hmm. focus on the mission, mm-hmm. you'll find out that life is so much easier, so less stressful, <laughs> right? And then yeah. you start, it's like uh, doing this Bible college, uh, all the miracles I've seen where God told me to do something and then I watch him work and then I... Uh, get to come in and do the cleanup afterwards. It's yeah. So cool. Tell us one of those stories because, you know, often when <clears throat> we follow what God is telling us mm-hmm. and we don't see maybe the financial provision or right. the connections that we think we need, <sighs> that can kind of freeze us and make us think, well, I don't know if I should go Man. forward, but you've had to uh-huh. trust God to provide things as you move forward. Talk to us oh, about great. how he's done well, that. It's Well, let me put in this one thing uh, and, and later I'll talk about compensations, but uh, in order to know what God wants you to do, you need to meet with him every morning. I ha- mm. have, God and I have a business meeting every morning. I, I listen to a sermon. I worship for about an hour or so. And then him and I talk about what's happening that day. Mm-hmm. And uh, I ask him, I says, what are you doing? And what part do you want me to play? And he lays on my heart what I'm supposed to do. So I'm building this Bible college. I actually started, my first trip down here was in August uh, to work with the uh, Central Florida Christian Chamber of Commerce. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and now what are we, a couple of months into 2024, and uh, every morning I ask him what we're going to do. Now, I have an idea of what we're supposed to do because I've started several businesses. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. One of them, since this, and I've, this is my third nonprofit, mm. one of them is raising funds to be able to do what we're supposed to do, right? Mm-hmm. So, and and I should have started that months ago. <laughs> and every morning I'm, I, I'll throw out and do we start raising funds today? He says, no, I got that covered. Don't worry about it. Mm. next day how about now no 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 don't worry about it i got it covered so here's how he had it covered this is such a god thing on fridays i attend a a christian men's mastermind Uh, Mm. all of us are entrepreneurs and we talk about what we did what we're going to do what we need prayer and help on that kind of thing well back in april was when i first uh, announced to the world that eventually i was going to do a college god had laid on my heart that this college he had told me about a long time ago was going to start so I am announced it at the mastermind, and this one gentleman is there. His name's Mike, mm. and uh, he is so busy. He pops in once every six months. That's all you see. Oh wow! And I've only <laughs> seen him on this mastermind, and um, he does uh, fundraising for nonprofits. And after the mastermind, he calls me and gives me some pointers. And I don't see him again for till this year, right? Well, January fifth was my birthday. It's Friday, and uh, Kathy stayed home from work to spend the day with me. And she uh, went, we were worshiping together uh, that morning. And she comes over, scoots over to me. We're sitting on the floor, tossing the ball to our Pomeranian while we're worshiping. And uh, she puts her head on my shoulder and she says, Papa, could you give my husband the most incredible birthday present? So Mm. awesome that there's no doubt it came from you. Hmm. I'm like, (laughs) oh, Touch your heart. (laughs) Touch my heart. (laughs) And here's what God did. Two hours later, Mike calls me on the phone. Now, he's raised money for nonprofits for 20 years. That's his business. That's what he does. Mm -hmm. He says, Bob, today God laid on my heart to um, cancel all of my clients and work 100% for you until you have the $150 million you need to build your campus. What? And God says, see, there you go. (laughs) Whoa. Yeah. He's actually been down here to Florida twice with me to talk to people Mm. to start that networking to build uh, donor partners. So, wow. Um, I'm almost speechless. <laughs> uh, at the same time, though, I'm thinking about those that are, are watching and that are listening. And sometimes conventional business wisdom, you've, we've talked mm-hmm. about how important that is to have that foundation. Sometimes following condition, conventional business wisdom is actually not the best path right. because God wants to do something different. So I think that's why that business meeting that you mm-hmm. have with God every morning is so important. So you don't just run off and do right. things based on what you think you should do, 
but really checking in to see what God wants. To well, that's do. that's exactly it. I remember, and you probably have done this. Most Christian business people have. You go off to do something, and on the way, you say, "God, can you bless?" This? Oh yeah, right all the time. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't it be better to say, "God, what are you mm, doing?" And can yeah. I come? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. and to your point, much less stressful because mm-hmm. the weight of everything. Um, wouldn't be on you Mm -hmm. because you're simply joining God where he's already working versus trying to create something on your own. And you know, and, and the first time I started doing this, because it was a, first it was a concept when I was trying to write the book, uh, God's Partner. I said, well, I've got to do it or I can't tell Mm. people to do Mm -hmm. it. Right. And at first it was very stressful because I knew what I should be doing as a business person and God's having me do this and this other thing. And it's all amazingly come together. And once I learned to trust him and I saw some of the victories, like um, Crystal Parker is the president of the U.S. Christian Chamber of Commerce. She lives in Orlando. Mm -hmm. A person in Kansas that I put on my advisory board uh, who does accreditations says there's this woman named Deb Brown Meyer that you have to know. She's one of the top Christian salespeople in the country. She wrote a book, Sell Like Jesus. You got to get to know her. Turns out she lives 45 minutes from my house. Now, a person in Kansas told me about this other person who lives (laughs) right down the street and actually is at a Mm. church that Kathy and I went to for like three years. We just, it was a mega church. We never saw each other. So I meet her. And then she says, there's this other person you need to meet called Crystal Parker. She lives in Orlando, Florida. So I call her up. We spend two hours on a Zoom call just talking and becoming fast friends. Mm. And uh, she has opened up so many doors that I would never be able to open, open up down yeah. here in Florida. And and it was all just by listening to God and partnering with God's people around the country. Yeah. Now, you mentioned something that I think is, is really important to Orlando, Florida is where the college is going to be. Talk to us about how God oh. ordered your steps to even oh, come here great. because you're yeah. you're not here I'm in not, Orlando. No, so I why Orlando? In, <laughs> yeah, I live in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Well, back in 2015, I actually wrote a business plan for a college I thought I was going to start. And the idea was to start online first and then have a brick and mortar. Mm-hmm. And then um, in Tampa, there was a college that was for sale. It was uh, Clearwater Bible College. So we went there to look at the campus, thinking about buying the campus, mm-hmm. and it fell through. So I just kind of shelved the idea, thinking God uh, wasn't ready for me to do this yet, right? So then in April, he says, it's time. And here's how he told me. Uh, I know people all over the country and three different people from three different areas of my life that do not know each other all called me when one week and all said exactly the same words. They said, hey, what's going on with that Bible college you were going to start? And the first one, it's like, okay, yeah, whatever. The second one, well, that's a coincidence. Confirmation. The third one, <laughs> wow, okay, God, I'm ready. I hear you. I hear you now. <laughs> Let's do this. So- uh, Kathy and I get a map of the United States and we looking at, we know we want people to go out and do evangelism every week. So it has to be nice weather. So even though you're going out, doesn't mean anybody else is yeah. to talk to. True. So we eliminated everything in the snow area. Mm. So then we looked at California, Texas, and Florida. And we figured Florida had more tourist traffic, which would give us more people around the world to talk to. So we settled on Florida. Mm. All right. And then we're thinking Tampa, or Orlando, or maybe the Fort Lauderdale, or um, Miami, or something like that. So we had like three areas picked. And right about that time is when uh, Deb says, call Crystal Parker, right? While we're still trying to decide. And I call her, and she asked the same question. uh, Where are you thinking? We said, Florida. She says, where? And we told her the three areas. And she gave me a pitch for Orlando, the fact that millions of tourists come through here every month. Wow. And that they the and there's a Central Florida Christian Chamber of Commerce that had just started a new outreach concept where they're trying to bring more God into the marketplace. Mm. And they said your college would fit like a glove with that concept. So I I beg you to make it Orlando. We'll help you. The chamber will help you as much as you want. I said okay. So before we hung up, I, I the decision was made. We were going to be in Orlando. And and so if you hadn't listened to God in terms of connecting with different people, maybe Absolutely. it wouldn't be here in Orlando? Seriously, it might not have been here. Uh, I think that's what God wanted it all the time, and that was how he told me. Mm. But yeah, if I hadn't have been listening to all these other Christians, uh, yeah. my, my spiritual mentor uh, says um, God is infinitely relational. 
Mm. He says he wants you to work with other Christian brothers yeah. and sisters. That's just what we do. Yeah, because it certainly would have been easier if you had gotten that divine download of, hey, go to Orlando. Oh, but yeah. that wasn't the way that he right. wanted to work. And, yes. you know, what I'm learning too, Bob, is that God does want us in community and that we're so much better right. when we work together versus working in silos, 100%. right? Yes. And he demonstrated that. And you know, story. as an entrepreneur, you are solo focused, yes. right? Yes, yes, yes. And he says, okay, you learned a lot there, but that's not really how I want you to be. I want you to work with all these people. So we even picked our board of directors and our advisory board based on individual talents and what they can bring to the table and all of them are like top in their area. So so talk to us about that because many people that are listening to us may be going into the path. Maybe they aren't necessarily going to start a Bible college, but having the right board mm -hmm. is something that's really, really important. I've heard some horror stories about yes. boards gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about the types of players that are important to have on the board and, and how you okay. kind of know what the best fit is. All right. Well, the backstory on all of them would take us another couple of hours. But let's go. <laughs> Uh, the, the, I'm on the board, Kathy's on the board. Both of us have a lot of entrepreneurial experience and a lot of evangelism experience. That's what we bring to the table. Ed Logren is a vineyard pastor in Chicago. He's my mentor and he's also an attorney. Mm. So he could, all the legal, legal stuff, stuff we need to do. Yep. And, uh, one of the things we're looking at is what the church is going to look like in the future and how do mm. we train our people to be that and yeah. Ed's running that idea. Mm -hmm. on how, how do we do electronic uh, follow-up and discipling yeah. so that we can do that anywhere in the world? Uh, do we do small groups or micro churches or regular churches or a combination? And, and he's working all of that, right? So we can develop the junior, senior level courses to get them ready for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Amanda uh, is on the board. She is an incredible uh, entrepreneur, uh, her and her husband and Kathy and I are best of friends. They live in Houston. And she has a great way of helping entrepreneurs find their, their niche product and their ideal client based on what their personality and spiritual gifts are. Okay. So yeah. she's there. And that's the board. And then the advisory board has uh, Brand, uh, Brandy, who is uh, – she's – Worked at two colleges. One of them, she was intimately involved in the accreditation. So she's working all the accreditation for us. Mm. I don't want to happen to kids what happened what to happened me. What happened to you. Right? Yeah. That, so we are going to be accredited. So if they want to transfer in or out of our college, no problems. So she's mm. working that. Deb Brown Meyer, the, the top salesperson yeah. in the country, she's uh, working on some of how we're going to, courses we're going to use to teach them how to sell their products. Yeah. Um, Mike, the, the gentleman that uh, is uh, the fundraiser, he's on the advisory board. And of course, he's responsible for all the partnership interfaces mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and right now, that's about it. We're looking at putting two more people on our board. And uh, we have a, a pool of five or six that have skill sets that are vital to a college. And we're, we're going to try and just pick two out of that. So, yeah. And then the third thing we have, and God just laid this on my heart, and I don't know why not earlier, last week, he says, I want you to pick five people anywhere in the country that will pray for you guys every week mm. or every day. Mm. So uh, one of my clients, she's actually a professional Christian recording artist. And uh, she's taken on the, the chore of being the head of the prayer team. And she's gotten uh, four of the ladies wow. from around the country. They meet every day. Uh, to pray for whatever I send out, or she's got a list of generic mm -hmm. things that we need right now. Wow. So you you also have several leadership roles that you're navigating, right? For the school, um, you've got the board, you've got your clients that mm -hmm. you're leading. Yeah. You, are you still in the real estate? So you're wearing a lot of hats still, it sounds like. We, um, uh, we oh, here was another thing God did that was really funny. Uh, I knew back in like 2015, I was going to do a college someday. You know, there's a difference between anointing <laughs> someday, and huh? appointing. Right? Yes. Like yes, God there anointed is. me to do a college, but mm. I hadn't been appointed yeah, to it yet. Yeah, yeah. So I knew that was happening. So I thought I'm going to start saving money. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to be real transparent. I saved up from that time to now $500,000 and paid off my house, which is worth 500. So I thought I had a million dollars to start the college, yeah. which is a great start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God thought he, uh, he was doing a Gideon thing. <laughs> so 
three years ago, in November, Kathy's dad had to move in with us. And we both decided, we prayed about it, and it was the right thing to do. But we had to build an apartment in our basement. We got an apartment down there now, like that really nice that we built. We had all of his furniture moved from Ohio to to Pennsylvania so that it would feel like home. Uh, he had a farm that his son lived on out in Ohio that they were afraid it might get taken if he had to go into a nursing home. Mm. So I, I bought the farm so that it can't be you touched. You have to worry about that. Yeah. Yes, you don't have to worry about that. And he has uh, Parkinson's and dementia and, and some other issues, so he can't be alone. So we have a staff that comes in and takes care of him. Turns out that's all very expensive. Yes, very. <laughs> so um, April, when God told me to build a college, this all, I didn't see this until later, but the beginning of April, I noticed that the 500 was gone. Mm. I'd spent it all on him. Mm. Well over 100000 on just AIDS every year. Mm. So that was gone. So I, so in my head, I'm thinking, aha, but I still have the house. <laughs> aha. Aha. Right? So I lost the, the f- first 500000 Now I still have the 500 in the house. And I'm thinking, aha, now I got something. So the next week, we take Kathy's dad to the doctor and tell him our plans, You know, figure out how to get him down to Florida. And he says, I don't think he'd make it. I think he's got to stay here. So our senior aide, the one that runs the whole team, uh, says that, uh, she, she comes up and tells us that her and her husband had been praying about it and uh, they would be willing to move into the house with their 18-year-old daughter mm. for the rest of his life, what be it two months or 10 years. He's 89 right now. So they're mm. going to move in. So the good news is we have somebody to take care of him. The bad news is I can't, can't sell, sell the house. house. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, and then right after that, like another day later, God says, I'm ready for you to start the college. After he takes all my money away, right? Wow. And I'm thinking, later when, I, when it dawned on me, his timing, I thought, yeah, real funny. <laughs> that was the plan all along. That was the plan all along, yeah. So it's, it's part of the lesson. There's so many lessons that we're talking about today, but I hear so many things. One, you cared enough about Kathy's dad that it wasn't, I need to keep this money because I need it for the college. Like you put mm-hmm. people first. Right. You took care of him you made sure that he had the support. He was able to get the care that he need, bought the farm, all of that. And then I, I, I get that you probably thought, hey, I'm still going to be able to do this, but uh-huh. that didn't work out either. So there, there was a lot of uh, trust that you had to place that yeah. as you were doing what you believed in your heart was the mm-hmm. right thing by people that God would do That's the right, right thing for you. And you know, and it wasn't like an instantaneous epiphany of how to deal with money and God. Hmm. He taught me that. And the way he taught me that is when Kathy and I got married on our wedding night, we got on our knees by the bed and prayed and dedicated our marriage to him. And uh, at the time, we were both making six-figure incomes. And uh, we thought that we couldn't afford to tithe because that's one thing he laid, laid on our hearts. And here's what the lesson he did. We said, okay, we can't really afford to tithe which honestly was a stupid thing to say. <laughs> but God still met us where we were. Hmm. So we thought, we, we thought, okay, we'll give $50 this month and then 100, every, 150 and raise it 50 every month to kind of ease into the shallow end of the hmm. pool. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, to get to 10%, we would have to tithe $2,000 a month. Hmm. All right. That was, that's what we had to do. And we did this every month for until we got to $5,000 a month and still had not reached our tithe. <laughs> wow. And, and that was the day that I, when we came to that realization, that's when I went to church and said, I'll do whatever you want. And basically what he says, well, I don't want your money. You've yeah. proved that. I want you. Mm-hmm. And I want you to go out and tell people about Christ. So um, that happened. And then the next thing that happened is we were living in a, uh, about a five or six thousand square foot house in the outskirts of DC. We had paid two sixty for it. Went to seminary. We graduated seminary in uh, summer of two thousand and eight. If you remember, two thousand eight oh, is when the, the real estate bubble yeah. burst. Oh. Well, we sold our house just before it burst <laughs> for six hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So we <laughs> what a windfall. That's right. And oh, I forgot another cool part. 
when we were getting ready to, we were doing seminary part time and we had went to that Ohio thing where a thousand people got saved. When we came back, I told Kathy, I looked at the catalog. I said, if we quit our jobs, we can graduate next summer mm. and go out into the ministry right away. So uh, we looked into it. We were going to do a home equity line of credit. And uh, we told our bosses that we were quitting. She was working in Virginia. I was working in Maryland. We told our bosses we were quitting. And they both offered us to be consultants at two days a week at more than what we were making full time. No way. Way. So we, um, so we did the tithe thing, started leading people to Christ, went to seminary. God gave us a raise to go to seminary full time. And then he gave us $400,000 to start our ministry when we graduated. Hmm. So if he's done it before, he's going to take care of it I this time, no doubt. Serious zero. I, it's weird. Growing You're up not the way worried. There's no stress, yeah. no anxiety none, around none it at all. Whatsoever. I'm like, mm. you know, I, I saw all those miracles God did. I've seen all the things he did, like hooking me up with Crystal Parker and the Christian uh, chamber and all of that. Well, there's no reason to be worried about money. Mm. He's got it all anyway, he's got it, right? Yeah, he's got it taken care of. And if the money never comes and the college never starts, that was his responsibility, not mine. Hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so and, going and, back to that joint venture agreement that that's you right. had with God. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Hmm. And and oh, and back to the compensation. That was the last part. Um, you know, he says in Malachi, which I learned uh mm -hmm. from our tithe example, God it's the only command in the Bible where God says, I dare you yes. to try this mm -hmm. if I don't bless you over and above anything you can imagine. And he does. We've given I think our lowest year of giving has been $60,000 yeah. yeah. and it's all from his blessings. Mm -hmm. And I, I would tell all of you, uh, if you're listening to this, God's daring you to give your tithe or more because he will 100% guarantee bless you more than you can ever imagine. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny as I hear you sharing that in my Bible reading time this morning, I was actually reading about uh, the rich young ruler and how he had this conversation with God and like, mm -hmm. I, I've, you know, what do I need to do? Right. And God says, you know, you know, the commandments and he walks them through mm -hmm. it. And then we finally get to the point, the moment of decision where, okay, well, sell everything mm -hmm. and follow me. Yeah. And that rich young ruler walks away and says, no, I, I can't, I can't do it because um, the money meant more in that That's moment right. yes. than, than following Christ. And as I was reading the commentary for this, Bob, it shared that, hey, you know, we often look at this and think, well, he must have been really, really rich. Uh, but if we look at where we are today, many of us that live here in the United States, uh, we live a very rich life. Oh, yeah. So we, we can very easily be in the exact same place that that rich young ruler was mm -hmm. yep. and have to make this decision. And I think we make that decision more often than we think. Yes. Is it going to be that the money is mm -hmm. more important to me or the things that I have, the status that I have versus following God? Mm. And That's you've right. had to face that decision many times in your life as well. Yeah, and, it, and after the lessons he taught us, it's really an easy thing to do mm. because he loves us more than we would ever, ever imagine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he wants the best for us. He wants that. I think that's, you know, that's a really good point, right? It's, it comes down to what we believe mm -hmm. about God. How we, do we see him? That's right. And, and, it, and it comes down to what we believe, period, because mm. it was a James that says faith without works it's is dead. dead. Yeah. You know, and it's like a simple example. Say you have uh, lung cancer. Are you going to go to the doctor and have mm. it fixed? Or are you going to go to somebody that lay hands on you and have mm. it fixed? And which one do you believe? In? Yeah, 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 mm. yeah. Your actions will ultimately right. indicate what you believe. That's right. And so you are moving forward in faith with the Wise Bible College. You've got your board. Mm -hmm. You have the fundraising guru. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you still believing God for to come together for the college? We need a couple of more professors. So if any of you like <laughs> to teach Bible classes or uh, business classes, look me up. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need, um, we want to do 30 students the first year. Mm. So, uh, and so we need favor there because we're trying something different. Uh, 
typically a college will go to recruit students at Christian high schools. I mean, if it's a Bible college mm -hmm. or homeschool organizations. Yeah. What we want to do is we want to get uh, this first year, we're just recruiting students from the Orlando area and we want to do it through their churches. Uh, so what I would, would ask is prayer for favor to get in to talk to pastors and their uh, organizing boards to say what we'd like to do is have you give us a student and that student will stay at your church for the four years they're in at, in some sort of apprenticeship mm -hmm. program where they can run maybe an outreach ministry and, and apply what they learn at the college. So what, what that does is it gives us a student that's motivated and supported by their whole church. It gives the world uh, a very dynamic minister when they graduate, and it gives the church four years of growth from a young man or woman uh, who has a lot more energy than we do at our <laughs> age, right? Yeah. And uh, that can go out and, and build an outreach program for their church. And typically when you do something like that, they'll either go out and, and make their church proud in a ministry someplace around the world, or they'll stay and get hired on. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the other cool thing about what we do when they're on that apprenticeship program for the four years, the church doesn't pay them. They're mm -hmm. building their own business so they yeah. can pay themselves. They pay themselves. Yeah. Right. So, so they never have to worry about where their, you know, meals are going to come from, how they're going to support themselves exactly. and their families. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we'd like prayer for favor for the pastors in the area, uh, to, to meet with us and hear what we'd like to do. Yeah. And, uh, and the professors and the, and the meetings and also the fundraising. Uh, if you've got a uh, million dollars or five dollars in your pocket that God's laid on your heart to give someplace, uh, I would uh, pray that you consider us. Yeah, we'll make sure that everyone uh, watching and listening has the links and the information so that they can support in a way that they see fit. Oh. Bob, you've had an almost unbelievable journey. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not done yet. Oh, no. no. Um, is there anything else beyond the college that you're still looking forward to doing? One of, um, it's funny, uh, one of the, the men in the, the Friday Mastermind, uh, very prophetic. And the other day, he says, God wanted me to tell you that your dream's not big enough. Mm. And I'm thinking, we're starting <laughs> campuses. And I've already got, uh, Kenya is one of my favorite places. I've been mm. there a few times. Uh, we're we're going to start a, a college in Kenya and Uganda, in the Philippines, and Brazil, and several other places. Wow. And I'm thinking, how much bigger can, can it, it get? Be? Yeah, I'm just excited. Hmm. One of the one of the motivating factors for doing this school and not delaying is uh, we don't know when Christ returns. That's right. We do know that the devil is trying to push his hand throughout history. Mm -hmm. The last time was in the early 1900s, I think, when. Uh, uh, Lenin and Stalin and Hitler and Mao Zedong and Pol Pot all rose up and killed tens of millions of people. And now we see, I think, another uprising right now, another massive attack of the enemy with um, uh, who would have thought five years ago that you would be the bad guy if you thought it was wrong that a man dressed as a woman danced sexually yeah. in front of kindergarten yeah. students. Yeah. Different right? world now. It's, it's seriously, and it accelerated mm -hmm. so fast. Very quickly, yes. And, uh, and I have... Uh, evangelism friends all over the world from Pakistan to Australia to Brazil to everywhere that are saying they're seeing the same things in the, in the other in cultures, countries, yeah. that the morality is being the thing that's attacked right now. So I think time is of the essence. When uh, One time I was in Kenya and we had done a conference on evangelism and then uh, the our sponsor had taken us to this park to kind of walk around before we were getting on our airplane. And there's a bunch of spider monkeys. They had as many spider monkeys as some places have squirrels. They're like everywhere. <laughs> and uh, we we're all playing with them and stuff. And, and, and he comes up and he taps me on the shoulder and he says, he goes, Dr. Bob, we must mind the time. Mm -hmm. And he said it in this cute British accent. Yeah. Right. So I didn't, you know, take it seriously. I said, okay, a few minutes later, we must mind the time. And uh, finally it dawned on me, how much time do we have yeah, to make right. our flight? Yeah. And he told me, and I'm like, oh, we got to <laughs> mind the time. So here's my lesson is we have to mind the time because the devil's not waiting. He's oh, destroying no. as many lives as he can, as fast as he can. We, the Bible says, Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail yeah. against us. Mm -hmm. The reason the gates of hell cannot prevail is because we're on the attack. Mm -hmm. We're not sitting in defense inside a church, you know, it's That's good. That's good. 
So we, we can't wait. I can't wait uh, to see how the journey that you're on, Bob, continues, because I feel like with that word that your your dream isn't big enough, that there's more that you don't even know. And right. he's going to do exceedingly abundantly above what you could even ask or think in this situation, even though you don't know what else God could be doing. Maybe you do know the answer to this. What is the legacy that you hope to leave for your family and for the world? What I would like to see is that Wise Bible College becomes the prototype of colleges for the Bible colleges for the future. Mm. Because I do think we have gaps in what we're giving our future leaders that are going to be deathly critical in the war that we're engaging in right now. Mm. So, yeah. So my legacy I would like is to be the prototype of how we build kingdom warriors, kingdom leaders that are uh, that love to tell the story of Jesus and know how to make it all work and grow in the world that we're in today. Yeah. Well, Bob, we're all rooting for you. Uh, looking forward to seeing uh, the college open, you bringing mm-hmm. in your first set of students and having them make a difference in the world. You are a true beacon of light. And I thank you for taking the time to be here with us today mm-hmm. and share all of these great lessons. Uh, Listening audience, viewing audience, make sure that you follow the links in the show notes to learn a little bit more about Bob, the work that he's doing through his coaching, through the Wise Bible College. And if God is tugging on your heart, please follow that nudge and support in any way that you can. Thank you for joining us here for The Beacon Show. We'll talk to you again soon. God bless.